hello. Oh my god, Yuli. Oh, hello. <laughs> Yuli's just scratched me in the face, so if I've got a big line down my face, what are you doing? for the rest of this video then that is why <laughs> hello everyone welcome back to my channel if you're new here hi my name's claire and this is yoli i make videos all about house plant care sharing tips and tricks i've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy and today i'm going to be going through everything you need to know about the philodendron melanocrysum giving you kind of a general care overview some tips and tricks for faster growth and telling you a bit about my experience with it. So yes, let's get into it. So philodendron melanocrysum is commonly known as the black gold philodendron and you can totally see why. It's got these beautiful velvety, they're so soft, dark leaves and then if you look at the veins they are almost gold they're just absolutely stunning and also the new growth on the plants which you can kind of can you see kind of see here before it's properly hardened up and kind of matured often has a really beautiful gold tinge to it it's just such a beautiful plant as i've mentioned in some of my other videos my big melanocrysum did actually get thrips really badly last summer and i had to chop her up and i've got some of the babies from her here but this is the one that's probably doing the best at the moment this was the mother leaf and you can see actually the best the best example of the thrip damage is on this leaf here you can kind of see where it's been nibbled away all over there but yeah i propagated this plant and these are the babies this one i need to actually get a moss pole for i've just staked it at the moment i had it in my grow cabinet when i first set that up and it's just gone absolutely crazy it's got a new leaf on the way there it's just doing absolutely amazingly and then this one here this little one i've potted up in pure pond and it's doing really well this one was actually a wet stick propagation and it's kind of caught up with the others. I wasn't expecting it to do so well so soon. So I'm very, very proud of that one. And then this one here is the one that maybe isn't doing the greatest just aesthetically, but I think when it starts producing new growth, it's gonna look absolutely gorgeous. But this one, I just propagated in water. And I would say, although its root system isn't huge at the moment, I think it's probably coming coming to the time where I need to start thinking about potting it up just because I can tell the leaf's not looking very healthy and because it's obviously lost so much sap from when it was being nibbled at by thrips, it's just not looking great. Probably needs a bit more nutrients. So yes, that is, that's where I'm at with that. I will go through some stuff on propagation and stuff towards the end of this video. I did also make a video on how I got rid of the thrips when the infestation was really, really bad. So I'll link that video in the description box below if anybody's interested, just because these plants unfortunately can be quite susceptible to pests. So this little one here is currently living in my grow cabinet behind me, which although does receive some natural light from this room, is mainly just artificial light from grow lights. And it's doing really, really well. It's got a new little growth point there on the back. Um, and yeah, it's really happy like that. Ideally, what you want to make sure is that these plants aren't receiving too much sunlight, but also aren't in conditions that are too dark. So what's known as bright indirect light is gonna be best for them, which is pretty much like the room that I'm in now, not too much direct sunlight or just kind of gentle morning, gentle evening sunlight when the sun's not quite so harsh. But yeah, bright indirect light is absolutely best. Absolutely best is the best. If they're not getting enough natural light, what you'll probably notice first is that their growth will slow right down. They probably won't be giving you much new growth at all. And the growth that they are giving you is likely to be a lot smaller, not as lovely and full and big like this leaf here. And also they'll start to look quite stretched out and not as full and healthy as you'd like them to be. Once you've found a spot with the right lighting conditions, it's really, really important to make sure that their leaves are kept clean because basically a buildup of dust or dirt or anything like that is gonna stop them absorbing all of the light that they need. With most plants, I usually just advise to clean their leaves using a damp sponge or something like that. But because these ones have such lovely velvety leaves, they actually really don't enjoy their leaves getting wet. So what I would say for all of your velvety leaved plants and this also applies to ones that are furry or anything like that is to either use a dry microfiber cloth or what I do and this is a bit random but I always use a makeup brush I've got a clean makeup brush that I just use purely for this purpose and I will essentially just go over both sides of their leaves give them a really good dust turning your plant regularly is also really important if you 
you want to keep the growth kind of full and going all the way around, if that makes sense. With these plants, some people don't mind too much if all the leaves face the same way, because especially if you're getting them on a moss pole or something like that, it doesn't matter as much. It's more of an aesthetic thing. But yeah, as I say, if you would like the growth to kind of be 360, then it's really important just because they chase the light quite quickly. And if you don't turn them regularly, all of their leaves are going to start to face just one way. Another important thing to say is obviously if you do put your plant next to a window, I've mentioned already about direct sun, that's something that can damage your plants. But also, and this is something that people don't always think of, it's cold drafts, just because this plant absolutely hates cold drafts and will not be happy at all. So just be wary of that. When it comes to watering, these plants can be quite easy to overwater. And I would say personally that that's probably the biggest killer or issue causer in these plants, just because they are quite thirsty philodendrons. Compared to some of my others, they do like being watered quite a lot more, but that can often cause people to go a bit overboard, give them too much, cause things like root rots, which can be killers in your plants. So you've just got to be really wary of that. What I'll do with these ones, and to be honest, I monitor the soil in all of my house plants. I never stick to any kind of schedule or anything like that, but I'll always wait for the top layer of soil to completely dry out the first inch or so, just to make sure that I'm not overwatering. You can use a moisture meter for this if you're not quite sure. I personally just stick my finger down to the soil and feel, but if you like using a moisture meter, then go for it. As I've said in so many of my videos before, I'm sure you're all sick and tired of me saying it now, but I'm gonna say it anyway, is underwatering is always better than overwatering. And the reason that I always bang on about this is just because it's most of the time so much easier to save a plant that's been given too little water as opposed to too much. If you think you might have overwatered and caused root rot, then there are some ways that you can fix this. I've again made a video on this, so I'll link it down below along with any other useful links for this plant. But some ways that you can also help besides just monitoring the soil to regulate watering is using things such as pond as a substrate instead of soil that's really really great also using terracotta pots is really brilliant just because it's a porous material it helps to extract some of the water from the soil helps keep your plant happy if you know that you're prone to giving your plants a little bit too much love if you're using a regular potting mix like I've done with this one it's basically just really important to create something that's really airy really well draining but also retains moisture really well so with this one I've used a combination of house plants soil, perlite, orchid bark and horticultural charcoal which is what I've used for a lot of my philodendrons but this one seems really happy in it. Over the growing season which is the spring and summer months these ones are going to be at their optimum time for growing as you can see here this one is just giving me a nice new leaf because we've just come into spring woohoo so the best possible thing you can be doing to make sure you're providing them with all the right nutrients they need to support and encourage any new and existing growth is by fertilizing them. With these plants I tend to fertilize them every other time I water during the growing season. I've also said this before as well, but if you've got a plant that you've had for a while but never fertilized before, I would personally say, and I know this is just me and probably being overcautious, but I've had bad experiences before when I haven't done this, is just ease them into fertilizing quite gently. So for example, if your fertilizer bottle says to add one cap, I would personally just start with half a cap and just see how you get on from there. If your plants are responding well, then feel free to increase it to the regular normal do dosage. I don't know what it is amount, the regular amount, and yeah, just make sure you're not doing anything to make it go overboard so that you might risk sending your plants into shock. When it comes to humidity, although these plants don't need a massive amount of humidity like some tropical plants, they'll probably do best in about 55%. I've always personally found that they will always look healthier, more vibrant, a lot less prone to issues, again, like browning, brown tips, all that sort of stuff, if you do increase the humidity. I tend to keep the humidity at between 65 and 70%, and then my grow cabinet is currently at 85 so the humidity levels are really really high in there and my plants are absolutely loving it so yeah I would say if you're in any doubt crank up the humidity they are only going to thank you for it. Balancing the high humidity with higher temperatures is also a really 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 good idea especially if you want to encourage lots of new growth it's personally the best way that I found for my tropical plants to make them grow quickly. Also when the temperature in your house tends to be higher whether that's naturally or through central heating or fan heaters or anything like that, the humidity does naturally tend to drop. So just be aware of that and make sure to counteract that. So up the humidity when the temperature's more, basically. 
These plants tend to do best with a steady temperature, which means that it's not fluctuating up and down constantly, meaning that they have to constantly adjust between 18 and 27 degrees Celsius. But as I said, I always personally just like to keep it at the upper scale of that, just to make sure that they're growing healthily, happily, basically just mimicking their natural habitats as much as you possibly can. Also, I know I have already mentioned about cold drafts, but that's definitely something to be aware of because as I say, it can just cause loads and loads of issues from curling leaves to browning and yellowing and dropping leaves and your plants will not be happy at all. As I also mentioned and showed you earlier, these plants are really, really easy to propagate. This one here, I've propagated in water, but to be completely honest, from trial and error since I started this propagation, if I was to go back and do it again, I would personally use sphagnum moss just because I found it works so, so, so well. But basically what you want to do when you propagate these plants, you'll see all these little bumps behind the leaves here and these are the nodes and that's essentially where your roots are going to grow from. So if you wanted to take a cutting and propagate it, you would chop just below a section with a node and then you'd pop that into sphagnum moss like I've done sphagnum moss. I've done it in water. If I was doing it now, I'd do it in sphagnum moss. But you pop that into whatever medium you're using, perlite, water, sphagnum moss. And over time, you should start to notice roots forming. And then when they get to about, I'd say usually about four or five inches, then go ahead, pop them up and you've got a brand new plant. But yeah, as I say, the only reason that I'm loving using sphagnum moss right now is just because in my experience, the rate of it rotting is a lot lower and I've had a really high success rate. Also, it just helps to store humidity around the nodes of your plant, which really helps with root production and touch wood. I think pretty much all of my sphagnum moss propagations have not failed. That was very bad grammar. I think a lot of this has been very bad grammar. But yeah, I hope that makes sense. I hope you found this video useful. If anybody's got any questions, as always, <laughs> oh my God, I'm losing my mind today. As always, drop me a comment down below. I will do my best to help. But if you did enjoy this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day, and I will see you in the next video.